This podcast is produced by the Center for Deployment Psychology at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. The views expressed are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Uniform Services University, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. In addition, references to any specific companies, products, processes, or services does not necessarily constitute or imply endorsement by the Uniform Services University, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Welcome to CDP's podcast, Practical for Your Practice. Where we give you actionable intel to support what you do. One colleague to another. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Practical for Your Practice. I'm Dr. Kevin Holloway, um, the director of, what is it? Director of Online Technology Training and Telehealth at Center for Deployment Psychology. Let me try that again. Director of Online Training, Technology, and Telehealth here at the CDP. And I'm joined by my co-host. Co- <laughs> I'm joined by my co-horse. 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 I'm, I'm my your co-horse. co-horse. Let me try that again. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk today. I'll be your co-horse any day. <laughs> Perfect. Joined by my co-host, Dr. Andy Santanello. Hi, Andy. Hey, how's it going, Kevin? I have no idea what I do here anymore either, so I, it's okay. Who knows? It, it's it, quite a long list and yet a complicated title, I guess, or not. <laughs> so we're excited to be back with you all, and we've got a, a fantastic guest today. I'm really excited. Um, we've got uh, joining us Dr. Greg Rieger. Greg and I have worked together kind of in the way back history. So before I got to CDP, Greg and I worked at the National Center for Telehealth and Technology, got to do some really fun, exciting projects there looking at uh, leveraging technology for behavioral health uh, in the DOD. And Greg's no longer there either. I guess T2 doesn't exist as an entity anymore, though it continues on in the DHA. But welcome, Greg. Thank you. Very, very glad to be here with you. Nice to talk with you again. Glad to have you here too. We, <laughs> It's been kind of a long road. We've been talking about having you on for a while. And in fact, like we had, I had Greg as an, a guest for an earlier version of the podcast that never ended up getting published. So it's been a multiple, like this whole series of years to finally get you here. So I'm glad to have you here. Um, yeah, well, go ahead. It's, wild, but it's going to be great. Glad to be here. Totally. We'll have to dig that episode up from the archives when we release like the deep cuts, totally. you know, <laughs> version of our best, the greatest hits. Well, and the funny thing is, it's it actually is very consistent with what we're going to talk about today. Back then, we we recorded that just as the PE Coach 2 app was coming out. And we were talking a little bit about integrating apps into clinical care and kind of what was the difference between the first PE Coach and the PE Coach 2 app and things like that. And, you know, again, I mean, the, the episode in there, maybe we'll just splice in quotes from that episode, Greg. <laughs> to this one. It may or may not still be relevant, right? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, so Greg, tell us about yourself. What what what's your career looked like, and how did you get where you're at? Sure. Yeah, so I, so I'm currently working as the deputy associate chief of staff for mental health at VA Puget Sound, and we are sitting out here on the West Coast at, in Seattle and and Tacoma, Washington, and I'm also a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine. So I help lead our mental health operations. I see some patients and I also lead research on technology applications that might improve what we are trying to do on behalf of veterans and service members. That's really cool. What what kinds of technology are you exploring currently? Well, right now we are looking at a couple of different things. Um, I've got a randomized trial where we are looking at the PE Coach mobile app and we are randomizing veterans with PTSD to receive the evidence-based psychotherapy prolonged exposure, either with the PE Coach app or the same psychotherapy without the PE Coach app. We're really interested if incorporating the app into practice helps veterans engage in the active components of the psychotherapy and thereby improving their day-to-day functioning and symptoms. That's a, in some ways, kind of the study we've been talking about for a long time too. Like, so back when we were at T2, uh, Greg and I were uh, on the team that um, originally developed the PE coach, the original version of the app. And then in a little bit in, in collaboration with the VA. And of course that, that version is no longer out there, but that was, you know, one of the, the cool projects we got to work on together. I mean, Greg led that 
program that that development but it was it was great working on that and we've always wondered what how does it impact therapy does it you know does it help augment therapy does it help people be more adherent to the protocol does it help people be compliant with homework or we also wondered you know does that just create new reasons not to do the homework or you know uh, who knows it, it'll be fascinating to see what happens yeah there. yeah yeah we i mean to your point we've been talking about this for years and yeah. uh, the glacial speed of science means we'll have <laughs> answers to these questions in a mere four to five years so right. stand by maybe when we don't use apps on mobile right. devices anymore by, by that time we will have internal ais like right. it, Tony Stark That's stuff, great. right? We won't need a phone or anything. I, uh, I'm really curious to hear about, you know, there's apps for everything these days mm -hmm. um, and some can be used for good and some can be used for evil. I'm glad you're trying to help cell phone use be something that can be good for humanity. What have you found apps to be useful for in sort of the process of doing therapy with clients? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a great question and an important one because, you know, we know there's probably around 10,000 mobile applications for mental health purposes on our app stores. And of those, the, the estimates are that about, you know, three to 4% have any kind of evidence supporting wow. their use. And so the vast majority of apps that you search for and scroll through you know, a day-to-day a -day user has no idea if any research supports its effectiveness and the chances are there is none, right? Right. Um, and so we really have to think about, you know, what are these good for? What do we know about them at this point? And how do we help fill some of those knowledge gaps? So I, I think your question is, is really on spot. I, I think when um, healthcare providers are informed about an app that's been designed by subject matter experts. They've looked at that app themselves. They like it. They recommend it for use to a patient. And then they provide support and follow up on its use, uh, supervised use, if you will, checking in with them about its use. That's like the gold standard likelihood of a nice outcome, right? That uh, you've got someone using something that's probably good and they've got support in actually using it. I mean, one of the take homes that I've pulled from reviewing study after study is if we just build a great app and throw it out into the app store, tell a patient to use it, and that's all we do, that is not a recipe for success. Right. It's, it's right. highly unlikely that people will use it. If they do use it, they'll try it once on average, and um, that'll be it. They're unlikely to really benefit from it. So we've really got to do more than just building cool technology even if it's effective and thinking it's going to make a difference. Well, and that's, that's in some ways a really kind of an important point too. Like even just getting beyond whether an app is consistent with, you know, underlying theory for mental health and, and what we know about uh, doing therapy and interventions and what works um, even just, you know, how do you incorporate that into to care? Well, is an important piece. Before we even get into that, though, I was even thinking as you were talking about that, that many times, too, it, it kind of goes the opposite direction. A client will come to their therapist and say, hey, I saw this cool app and I've been using it or I want to incorporate this into therapy. You know, what do you think? Um, and, and it occurs to me kind of the things that tend to be motivating that are not necessarily peer reviewed or, you know, such a matter experts contributing to its development. It's, it's usually a very slick advertising campaign or, or even a, a fancy looking interface or even icon on their device. And, uh, you know, a couple of, of reviews on an app store. So like, how do you tell the good ones from the not so good ones or, or how do you, you pick out apps to even, you know, give, give a second look to it. If you've got 10,000 out there, that's a lot to filter through. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, let's be honest, you know, Kevin, when you and I were, you know, helping to design apps, probably the first 15 reviews were by friends and family, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go by the reviews in an app store to judge the effectiveness or clinical relevance of an app, right? So what does the average clinician who's super busy do? Right. Their patient comes in, says, I've got this app. I want to try it out or I've been using it. Mm -hmm. um, how does a busy clinician think about, I don't know, is this a good idea or not? 
Yeah, I think there's a couple of ideas that could be fruitful. Um, a number of groups are looking to try to make this easier for both consumers and healthcare providers by building, you know, what we might think of as app indexes that are online. So, for example, um, you know, one of these that I that I think is pretty well designed is a, a, a group out of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center that developed a mobile mental health index. It's free, it's available online. And they basically take the approach of, we are going to have experts describe what is in this app, and then you can sort out if this is a good idea for you to use. Cool. So they basically index things like, is there a privacy policy? If so, does it describe how your data will be used? Is this built based on good clinical foundations? Um, Etc. And they they index kind of each of these apps that's out there and how uh, these different areas of app quality exist or don't exist for each app. Um, the nice thing about it is they're using a framework from the American Psychiatric Association for for app evaluation. So there's lots of smart people thinking about the framework they are using, and uh, it's pretty useful. Uh, another similar framework uh, that takes a different approach to CyberGuide. Um, CyberGuide is a website where you can go and see a review of apps based on set criteria um, that have, you know, different uh, categories of use. They, they look at, you know, evidence for the app, usability of the app. Um, I think they also include uh, the credibility or transparency of the privacy policies. Mm. Um, and this framework uh, is really, you know, uh, another free and available group of expert reviews of apps. Um, all of these kinds of frameworks have limitations, but they can provide a starting place for a busy clinician who's like, let me see what's out there on this app. Yeah. So client approaches them with an app. One, one place to go check is one or, or more of these indices and just get a sense from we, we couldn't know all 10,000 apps that are out there for sure. Yeah. And you know, it, Ideally, I'd have the time to like research that app myself, right? Um, these groups have done this on my behalf, making it quicker and easier. Yeah. I don't have to go search, you know, PubMed to see if there's any evidence right. for this app each time a, a patient names an app. Right. One of the things I'm thinking about as we're listening, I'm li listening to the conversation is we're talking about evidence for an app or the information included in it. And um, as you were talking earlier about what doesn't work, say, hey, check this out, check out this app client, and they might check it out once, but then it doesn't make uh, an impact. What I'm curious about is, you know, is there research out there um, that is more looking at workable ways to interact with an app? Like what are some of the evidence-based evidence -based ways to interact with apps as part of treatment? What are we trying to train clients to do when they're interfacing with these apps that would be helpful to them? And it, it reminds me in some ways of what we might do with an old fashioned paper and pencil worksheet. You know, you, you might just introduce something in session and then send it home with the client and then they come back and they've done something different <laughs> than what we had intended <laughs> um you know or they like maybe interacted with that piece of technology that paper and pencil technology in a way that is not quite as helpful as we'd like them to be so you know if, if you're working with apps and you're including them in your your therapy with clients are there particular ways that clinicians might uh, deliberately train their clients to use these tools that are likely to be more helpful than not? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, in essence, we've, we've kind of moved the discussion from like, how do we pick a quality app to how do you use a quality app with a patient in a way that's likely to be useful, which yeah. is just as important, right? You know, I think there are some gold standard um, ideas out there that are gaining traction that are challenging in a resource constrained environment. So for example, VA um, launched a, uh, I, I don't remember their precise term, but something like a, a digital mobile app champion at, uh, at different sites around the country. And they did this at, at many sites and had formal training of these mobile app champions who then helped 
promote the utility of well-designed VA and DOD apps in clinical teams and supported contact with patients. Sometimes there are models of clinical champions actually contacting patients after the app has been introduced between sessions, right? For brief phone check-ins. Um, I really like the model of uh, an app called Focus with patients with serious mental illness, hmm. where um, it provides kind of just-in-time symptom management strategies. And they would have a, a digital interventionist reach out to the patients between sessions for phone contact and support, thinking about how to integrate the skills in the app in their day-to-day -day life with some coaching. Really nice models, right? Yeah. At uh, a more, a more you know, resource-constrained environment, at least could think about the basic question of how do we get clinicians to be digital interventionists? And that's a challenge because mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. essentially asking them to be an evidence-based practitioner with everything that comes with that, mm -hmm. along with becoming a subject matter expert at the user level of working with patients with a variety of digital expertise to support them in understanding how to use their device. Um, there's time constraints, there's multiple demands in large healthcare systems, there's um, any number of administrative requirements they're trying to complete. So this is a real challenge. And I think this is one of the, the areas that we need innovation in the future. Mm -hmm. And I, I think ideally we would partner FTE with our busy clinicians with uh, peer supports or or mm -hmm. others who can be trained to be digital interventionists and you walk out of the doctor's office and sit down with the the, the mobile app champion to to help support the adoption of these effective interventions it's a great question because i think about even just you know, the folks that um you know register for workshops the cdp puts on we we, we do workshops online um, especially since COVID, that's pretty much exclusively what we've been doing. And we see a, a whole range of comfort and skill, if you will, with technology, even to attend a workshop. And to then on top of that, you know, ask a clinician to understand the technology of an app enough to incorporate it into their, their clinical practice. And then on top of that, be tech support for their clients. You know, if, if things go wrong, that, that can be a pretty steep ask for some folks. For some folks, not so much. And for others, that, that can be tough. So I do like the exploration of these other models that they, you know, brings in some other folks that may have those skill sets that can be of support too. That's right. We, we also, I think there's a lot of areas for innovation here. And um, here at VA Puget Sound, we piloted a group in our residential programming focused exclusively on the adoption of mobile apps by patients in the residential setting. And um, we introduced the app. They had the opportunity to install the app. They used the app in group. Um, mm -hmm. And they then basically left and, and rehearsed the app coming back to group the next week to talk about how that practice went. So, it's, you know, you've got a, a population that likely could benefit from that additional symptom support and a, a context where they're living in our clinical setting with a chance to support them and get some rehearsal. Uh, and troubleshooting. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of room for innovative approaches like this. <laughs> that in vivo practice of the process of using the app, downloading it, clicking it, going through it, finding the information you need, having somebody there to support you when you make mistakes seems so critical. And I'm thinking about when I use, I use lots of apps in my therapy work. And the ones I use most are often things like basic calendars. Right. And, and no, seriously. <laughs> yeah. And, and to do lists. And I got to tell you, I've gotten away from saying download a calendar and start putting things on there and let's talk about it next week. Because what I've noticed is clients will go home and they might download the app, but then they'll get in there and not necessarily know the mechanics of it. Like, how do I add an item there? And like, oh, I misspelled it. Oh, this is frustrating. I'm going to put it down. So yeah, being able to actually sit down with clients and say, pull out your phone, let's sit together. And I want you to practice adding a, a calendar item on there. Let's like, see how that goes. Oh, see you, you pressed here when you should have pressed there. Here's how you set an alert. Just that little bit of extra training probably only takes a couple of minutes, but is probably so critical 
in having people who could really benefit from this work. That's, I mean, lots and lots of money, lots and lots of research and time has gone into develop these evidence-based apps. Such a shame if they kind of sit on the shelf because that a little bit of additional training isn't there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we've got a lot of challenges in this area and it's super exciting. Like this field is so exciting, but boy, there's careers of research and innovation to be done. We, we did a survey not too long ago, Andy, just a local survey. So, that, you know, the results may not generalize, but we asked veterans sitting in the waiting rooms of our primary care and mental health clinics simply of the VA and DOD mental health apps, which have you heard of and which have you used? Very simple survey. And we asked them what kind of mental health challenges they had. So um, just as, you know, for example, probably the best known VA app is PTSD Coach, right? Mm -hmm. Psychoeducational app on PTSD. So of the veterans who did the survey who reported having PTSD, only 7.5 had ever tried PTSD Coach. Oof. And probably probably 120% of that sample had a cell phone. Right. right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> almost everybody. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, that's on the positive end on the, the more challenging end of the veterans who reported insomnia, not an infrequent challenge. Mm-hmm. Only 2.1% had tried CBTI coach. Ah. So, you know, veterans don't necessarily know about or have tried these apps, even if they have the challenges these apps are designed to support. Mm-hmm. That is just, um, it's disheartening because both of those apps are just so useful. I mean, the, the CBTI coach app in particular, th- there's so many wonderful tools in there. It will actually calculate a, you know, your sleep prescription and it's so much easier to fill out than a traditional sleep diary. It, it's got built into it. Some of the, you know, mindfulness skills that we want people to teach with some really high quality guided meditations. It's like, ah, it makes me sad to hear that like only 2% have heard of them or use them. What do you so think what, the gap yeah. is? Yeah. So like, what can, what's the, yeah, I mean, so, so to your point, um, there, there's multiple steps that have to happen, right. Um, for, for CBTI coach to be used, that's, that's generally not thought of as a standalone self-help app. If, right. if I understand it correctly. So you know, that percent may reflect the number of veterans with insomnia who are not engaged in an evidence-based treatment for, for that problem. Um, so there, there's several things that affect that percentage. Um, but, you know, I think it does illustrate the, the, the need for VA's great work trying to do implementation of mobile applications and practice, the need for that to continue and for additional innovation. I mean, the, uh, that, that digital mobile applications champion project I talked about was massive, massive, very well thought out, very well designed project, had a massive impact on thousands of veterans. Um, and uh, that project and, and things like it need to continue. And smart, smart people need to keep thinking about how we, how we get these interventions into the hands of, of patients who need them. Greg, I was thinking too, that some of our listeners may be wondering like, so what? So, you know, a lot of our traditional therapies don't include apps. I mean, in, in fact, none of the protocol therapies, the EBPs that, that we teach at CDP, for instance, and that's certainly not exhaustive, but none of them like require the use of an app. There's, there's no need or, or mention of an app, uh, you know, in these protocols, many of the apps that have been developed to go alongside them are meant to be kind of, you know, secondary, like augmenting or, or whatever. And so I guess, you know, on the one hand, I can think that some of our listeners may be going, yeah, so what? So we don't use apps, who cares? Um, but on the other hand, I, I mean, I know I'm, I'm a nerd and, and I know our listeners know that if, if they've heard more than one episode. And so I get all excited about, you know, geeking out about technology and stuff. And I can think of all the potential and all the fantastic ways that, that apps could positively impact therapy. But, but Greg, can you speak to that question? Like, so what? So what if these apps aren't being used? Well, I think it's an important question. And I, I like the question. There are privileged clinicians and patients for whom the answer to so what is, so don't use it. Right. That's great. You're linked with a a well-trained and effective 
therapist who can help you with your problems and you don't have access to an app, you're going to be just fine. <laughs> right? Sadly, across our very large country, that is not the case for most. Many, many, many people do not have access to well trained clinicians uh, or evidence based treatments and may live in parts of the country where that is unlikely to change anytime soon. Mm -hmm. The ability to arm those patients with well designed, high quality, and effective self care solutions can really be an important improvement in their day to day functioning in their lives. Yeah. And so, um, there is a, a really important so what there at the most basic level. The follow on is that uh, many of these tools have the potential to to improve what we're doing, even when someone may have access to to support and help. Um, for example, it may uh, help someone kind of identify the the challenges they're having or, or track their symptoms. Some people, uh, you know, who are struggling with uh, you know, risk, thoughts of suicide can kind of use these apps to develop their safety plan. One's available mm -hmm. in PTSD coach. And they can do that even before they've linked to therapy. Obviously, we want these folks connecting with face-to-face -face or telehealth um, clinicians to, to help improve the challenges they're having. But there's some real important kind of segues between care, support between care, support for patients who can't access care. Um, so I think there really is an important so what there. I think that question of access is a big one, just given, you know, what, going back to Andy's point, like 120% of our folks seem to have, you know, access to a mobile device. And, and, and I mean, of course, that's exaggerated, but we, we have a, a smaller percentage of people who have access to good, high quality, evidence based therapy as well. So, that's I mean, right. that, that might help bridge some of that gap. That's right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, and then I think it's really fun to also think about the future of mobile apps. Like, mm -hmm. okay, so, you know, we know the apps that are out there now, but where's all this going? You know, uh, and it's fun to imagine because we, we don't really know, right? But we can see where innovation is happening that might be promising or lead us to ideas of, uh, you know, devices that are adaptive, right? And, and have apps that can uh, identify when a user uh, needs support. You know, we can envision a time when they know the type of support that might be helpful. Um, devices that provide that support and monitor the outcomes such that they can modify and circle back if it's not effective. Um, I mean, it's really interesting to think about where all this might go. Some of the current work on wearables, you know, mm -hmm. these are devices that integrate data with mobile apps. I mean, the most basic examples are Apple watches or Fitbits, you know, mm -hmm. um, but devices that are, that are obtaining augmenting data uh, to kind of help apps think about, um, you know, how they can support the user and the future of artificial intelligence and, and right. machine learning to kind of incorporate with all that. It's really exciting. Of course, there's privacy challenges and, and security that comes along with all of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's interesting to think about. Yeah, I was even I was going to ask you what your thoughts are about kind of this emerging area of artificial intelligence, how it's really showing up these days around you know, chat interfaces and, and, uh, art and, and, you know, other things. And some of those have been interesting and, and maybe even a little bit creepy <laughs> to think about the, you know, the, the possibilities for the future of, of incorporating some of those new technologies who would have predicted this a couple of years ago, that that was going to be this, this emerging thing that we're all kind of talking about and how it impacts therapy and therapeutic relationships, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, and, and we, we often, I've even said it in this podcast, we, we, we often give the disclaimer, you know, these are not designed to replace uh, care with a therapist. You have to wonder, is there a future where it does? Like, is, right. is there a future where the technology is an appropriate and effective replacement for, for a human clinician? That's hard to imagine today. Um, but, you know, in the era, the realm of clinical science fiction, it's interesting to think about where all this is headed. For sure. I know a lot of us, I mean, myself included, 
um, you know, still have that question in the back of my head or like, are we going to be replaced? Is our job going to be obsolete because technology gets that good? And it, it's, it's hard to imagine it right now, but it's also hard to imagine that technology doesn't progress to the point where that becomes a real question. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is, you know, and you think about, uh, the current field of virtual humans, you know, mm-hmm. standardized virtual patients, um, at a very, very low and basic level, we are trying to replace live human training patients with digital patients. You know, where does this all go as, as technology continues to evolve? Right. Now, many of you, we didn't include this in, in Greg's introduction, but Greg's also had a lot of experience and research for virtual reality and how that can be used in, in therapy, particularly virtual reality exposure therapy for PTSD. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm looking at our clock and, and, you know, there's so much more we could talk about. We should definitely have you back in a future episode and talking about some of those other applications of technology, if you're amenable to that. Yeah. And if oh, you can, absolutely. And if yeah, you can't no, make uh, it, Greg, he, if you can't make it, right. Greg, you can just send your AI <laughs> and we can just talk to your AI. I have this AI. She's named Megan. I think you'll enjoy talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'd be happy to come back. There's a lot to talk about with uh, 3D virtual environments and and, and virtual patients. And uh, there, there's uh, a lot that we could have fun discussing there for sure. For sure. So definitely we're, we're going to get you on the calendar and we'll have you in it on in what, another two, three years. And- <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah we'll, we'll record it and then put it on the shelf and, and laugh about it years later. Right. That's right. And splice in quotes. And- <laughs> yeah. Well, in the meantime, as we're waiting for you to come back and to tell us all about virtual reality stuff, one of the things we always like to do is end our episodes with a couple of pieces of actionable Intel. So these are just, pieces of advice, tips that our listeners can take. And if in this case, wanted to start to incorporate apps into their clinical work um, that they could start doing right away after they listen to the podcast. So do you have a couple of pieces of actionable Intel that you might suggest to um, our listeners? They want to start to include apps in their work. Yeah. I, I, I think the first thing I would say is Go ahead and look at the American Psychiatric Association's website on their comprehensive app evaluation model. They've got five steps for key questions you can ask of any mental health app. And just getting that framework in your mind as a working model, I think, can be useful. Second, I would say go ahead and go to you know, the, the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center website for the mobile health index. Look at that and just look at it so you're familiar with it. You've seen how it works. So the next time your patient says, hey, I'm, I'm using mobile app X, you can pop on there and, and interface with that website to, to see what that app includes. Um, and then the third is, once you've done that, get familiar with a couple apps that are well-designed and are addressing issues common to the patient population you see and get familiar enough with them so that you can recommend them to your patients in a, in a model that provides follow-up support and, and check-in and follow-on sessions to see how it goes. And it's a great way to start uh, seeing how a patient benefits from them will support you in learning what does and doesn't work with future patients and uh, it can be a really successful, you know, launching point to to start using apps. That's really fantastic. Thanks. We're, we're going to include all of those uh, links and resources in the show notes. So uh, listeners, if you're wondering, how do you find the APA guidelines or, or some of these indices? We'll have those in the show notes that you can link to. Thank you, Greg. It's been exciting. It's been good to catch up, but also, you know, great to hear kind of where things are at with apps and some guidelines, uh, suggestions for how we might consider incorporating them. Yeah. Thanks so much. Really fun to be with you both. And, um, I look forward to talking to you in the future. Thanks. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to practical for your practice. Please feel free to subscribe, rate, and join in on the conversation in the comments until next time.